Yoga Damraskaita is an entrepreneur and founder of a company called One Mind Zone. It's an online coaching platform. She works quite a lot with people from the professional world and the tech world who are looking for ways to manage stress, anxiety, depression, a lot of it brought about by the environment that they're working in. And she helps people manage those issues using mindfulness techniques, meditation, yoga. Um, she also has a very interesting background in music, which we're going to, we're going to explore a little bit. Um, and she has a lot of uh, great ideas in terms of how to establish, build and, and market an online business as an entrepreneur, which I think is is quite exciting. And it reinforces some of the things we've encountered in the previous um, conversations with other entrepreneurs as well. So there's some some great hints and tips there for anyone considering making that leap and taking those steps. So um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I certainly enjoyed uh, participating in it. And um, if, if you've subscribed already, thank you so much. If you haven't, don't forget to hit the little black button at the top of the page. It really helps the, the channel grow. And um, yeah, enjoy the conversation. Leave as many comments as you want. We'll get back to you. And um, look forward to, to having that engagement. And um, yeah, enjoy. Thank you. Maybe write good. I started writing some articles, started doing content writing and stuff. I started mm. writing things and then I, I saw some, I saw the training that I did about the coaching, the body healing coaching training that I really, it really talked to me when I saw it, the ad. Mm. And after finishing this, I thought why I just don't start doing on my own and I can do it everything on my own. And this is how it started. I was like, well, all of the knowledge what I'm getting from the from the work with you know, with the online marketing, I'm just going to put it that in my business because nowadays this is the main thing actually. Um, mm. So we will. I was building my own website. I I started doing my own content, writing my own content, doing my own social media, and you know, and all of this somehow because actually, I don't know how you will know if you will do it if you won't try you because do. you know i'm i'm preaching to my to my clients all the time you must challenge yourself this you cannot live all the time in your comfort zone this is impossible you must challenge yourself so mm. i thought okay i have to challenge myself you know i have to i have to jump into the waters to see it to test it you know and learn I, from that so the first thing that you did right is Good evening. Welcome, Yorga. Hello, Connor. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting. Okay, brilliant. First question. Where are you from? I am from Lithuania. I'm from the second largest city in Lithuania, that is Konas. And I don't know if not if not many people know where is Lithuania is actually, actually the old post-Soviet Union country. And actually, I am, and actually, I am the last generation of being born on the Soviet Union still. <laughs> so it's that's really interesting. The Soviet Union disintegrated in 1990. Exactly. So you were born just before the wall came down. 1985. 1985. How would you describe your childhood? Well, the childhood, I would say, as, as I said, I was born in the in the times when it still was the weird times for everyone. And actually, everyone was fighting for the independency. And you could feel this kind of wish of, of escaping of this big monster, Soviet Union, you know. So this was always very present anywhere where you would be, you know, like in, in a kindergarten, as I remember, in the family and so on. Everyone was like really so... So I guess this is how it's also developed this way of just like, I don't know, being more differently, being more against the system and so on. And so, yeah, I was born in a loving family and um, my parents always supported me in many things what I did. Um, well, I was I was born in the Konas. I was living on the in the city on the Beton most of the time. And so, yeah, when you are a kid in the in uh, on living in the city, you also have to find different um, hobbies, different interests, different how to get yourself 
um, busy. So obviously the music came in right away from the very small days, from the five, six years old, right away. And yeah. And well, you weren't doing hard techno when you were five or six years oh, old. Oh no, right? <laughs> I was I was singing like Edelweiss, you know. <laughs> so kind of traditional folky kind of Lithuanian stuff. Well, no, you know, because it's like the journey also has been, uh, some, I tried to think before, like how I should have everything put in the places because there's been so much going on, you know. Mm. So they started uh, started just like, because my family, back to the family, the family been always like pushing all of the members of the family. My mother been always playing piano. My sister was play, played piano. All my cousins was also or doing some sports or playing piano. So everyone, apparently, how it is in the post-Soviet Union country, <laughs> because in, in Russia as well, it's been always very important to have your kids being educated in this way. So mm. I've been also kind of all the time being around this thing that everyone all the time was going to these different schools and stuff and singing and playing. And my parents were always testing my ears, like in a way, like how I'm listening the sounds. I was singing all the time since very small days. And my mom just brought me to the to the one very strong teacher in, in Lithuania. And right away after a few minutes, she said, like, yeah, yeah, she must go to the to the music school. So yeah, so all my life has been kind of started from from this and and started like from the classical education musical classical education playing pianos playing in the choruses and later on even evolved everything you mentioned about folkloric stuff at some mm. point actually at school i was also singing folkloric stuff wow i loved it, I loved it a lot and i actually still thinking about taking some motifs from from lithuanian folkloric part and maybe combining together with the techno music <laughs> mm. Mm. is there is there anything out of curiosity you think that the soviet system did well well probably oh. that kind of a consistency more like strict way like um starting and finishing things it was very important i think in that in the in the soviet union kind of you know like the things um for me, it's hard to say. Maybe my mom, my mother would say more about all of these things. You know, mm. I still remember. I still remember my mom after the after years of independence. She was saying, "Oh, in in Soviet Union was way better. We everyone had a job. There were no no poor people. There were no homeless people." I was like, "Oh, mom, they just didn't show you that, probably." You know, but um, um, yeah, I guess is this more like being strict with yourself and consistency? Either if you do the sports or the music or whatever is kind of. Mm. And this obviously came on my parents and the parents put it this on me. <laughs> mm -mm. And tell me, um, what changed then post-1990 in Lithuania? So you're growing up in Lithuania, you're, mm. you're a girl in school. Mm -hmm. Can you remember any significant differences? What was the biggest change post-Soviet that you can remember? Ka chaos, like, uh, of course, like all well, the time happens when the countries get independent. Mm. In the beginning, it starts chaos because everyone <clears throat> tries to take advantage of so many things. Um, obviously, this affected like the the race of the of the of the different mafias and so on. So also, the the everyone got a bit scared, aware that there were some parts of the country that you know that you go there has been controlled by specific mafias. This was a bit like dangerous times, but on the same time, you know, it was like amazing. Uh, everything opened up. The West mm. world just entered and been, I was so lucky that I was that first generation. I, I, I got everything first, like the Western TV channels, you know, like music channels, like and uh, everything. I, we could travel everywhere, you know, like, I mean, back then you could travel just inside the Soviet Union, you know. So, of mm. course, you would go there everywhere. But I, I mean, for me, it was like totally different world, you know, to compare with my sister, how she was growing, you know, because she could mm. not do any of this. Amazing. And tell me, did you, um, so you'd never traveled to the West, obviously when the wall was up. So the wall comes down, we're in a post Soviet, there's a little bit of gangster gangsterism going on in society. People are trying to take advantage of the new situation, of but you'd never been West of, you'd never been to Germany before. What age were you when you first traveled West? Can you remember? 
probably it was like eight years. So in 1993, 1994. Still, yeah, like this was also because the schools were doing the trips oh, outside wow. because it was already, of course, like, let's take an advantage of the fact that we can go out, you know. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I remember, I think, I think my first trip was like to Czech Republic or something like this because they were, I think, they, yeah, something like that it was. Interesting. Um... And Germany probably was like, I don't know, maybe it was like also like 16, maybe. 60 and um but you didn't move to germany full time when you were when you were 16 right that you no moved... <laughs> so how did you get to um you moved to berlin when what age were you when you moved to berlin uh 21 and you lived there for a number of years right 10 years 10 beautiful years beautiful because it, it was beautiful an incredible years. time it was an incredible time um what what years were you there can you remember uh, 2008 2008 to 2018 um and how would you describe berlin oh a yeah. uh, beautiful place to grow as a personality beautiful place to get inspired in any possible ways in in all possible art either you musician if you visual artist or any other it's just paradise for that you know, I, 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 all my life been all the time music and different kind of music. And then I've been performing until the time when I moved out from Lithuania all the time. I've been all the time on the stages and I, I had no stop because it was different projects and stuff. And when mm. moving to Berlin, it happened, it happened such a curious thing that I, I stopped performing because I was focusing so much on the work and making money and knowing the city mm. and be, and then i was just like enjoying and going to so many concerts uh, getting inspired of so many artists musicians going to so many concerts festivals uh just is just one of the best really places to 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 get that i know at least back then i don't know how it is really now obviously it's berlin it's always been will be or been was berlin you know mm. but um it's just for sure it's, it's the, the the best place to get inspired and what i'm wondering and to meet the best friends <laughs> yeah yeah and you 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 made a like i mean there was a huge network of people back then it was huge network it's crazy because you know sometimes I've, i was thinking like okay um i i changed a couple of the countries already living mm. you know and now thinking what is my second home you know of course the home is where you live the second home now i don't know anymore is is it lithuania is it berlin i think it's more berlin because all of my best friends are in berlin or at least the ones i met it's mm. from from there you know it's my family you know? mm -hmm. how do you think berlin has changed right so since i suppose the, the 2008 to 2018 when you go back now what's different do you notice anything well um a few years ago a few years ago uh, i went back to actually play a show mm -hmm. with, with my actual project and this was very interesting because this was also like a few years after I moved. I moved back to to Barcelona, and then I and I went there to see what is the difference, you know. Mm. And also went there to play. Also was, for example, staying in a hotel it was not my home, you know. <laughs> so it was like the the first feeling, and oh, it changed so much. It changed so much. Like I don't know, like the feeling, the smell of the city, you know, the 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 vibe maybe because i don't know when you don't live there anymore maybe you don't feel that anymore i don't know at first mm. everything got more, more more very expensive you know like i always remember berlin as well so always like say said by everyone is like one of the cheapest and coolest cities to live around that's why everyone was moving there because the rents were cheap and stuff mm. and obviously the whole gentrification problem evolved so much that Actually, if you walk on the, um, you probably remember the Warschauer Straße, the, mm. the, the bridge that is crossing the Kreuzberg east to the west, Kreuzberg with the Friedrich sign. Mm. It's almost impossible to recognize, you know, because it's like the, the huge buildings and stuff. And so everything, the city is changing a lot, a lot. And I guess they're trying to push it out. The, the people, 
that have less money more out people cannot get the rent uh, rent the apartments you know it's impossible to get apartments and people are struggling with this and um yeah music wise i i think it still keep on going <laughs> i remember uh nicola and kreuzberg gerlitzer park I when, mean, were, you... when, when was the last time you went to berlin now huh? um probably four or five years ago but it was only oh, okay. for a week and i i stayed in the mickelberger it was a different time oh, okay right? okay <laughs> okay <laughs> when i was staying on my brother's couch but um but I, I do remember that time and you could pick up an apartment for a couple of hundred euros. Exactly. It's impossible now. It's impossible. There's, yeah. there's, there's an ex I have friends that are searching for apartment for now for like two years already and they still cannot get it. Where are they staying? Well, they are like having like all the time, like swapping, going from place to place or maybe from couch to couch, I don't know, uh, and yeah. trying to get an apartment or they or the landlords come and they say, we have to... We have to renovate the whole house and we're going to raise the rents and yeah, you're out. Yeah. So it's the, the, the really typical, tough. the gentrification that's happening mm. in Western Europe. Unless you have money, obviously. Yeah. So everything, I guess, is possible then for you. Yeah. Um, interesting. Right. So after Berlin, then you set up, um, you, you went out on your own and you set up a company called One Mind Zone. Hmm. What was the... This is a very interesting journey that you took. So you're in music, mm. you're you're making production, music production as well, and you decided to take a a completely different um, angle and a completely different change. What's one mind zone about? Well, because you know this also this change it didn't come like out of the nowhere and out of the blue. You know mm -hmm. this change. This thing in my head was since I was probably 13 years old, you know, because like um, when I was very small, 13 years old was the Dalai Lama, His Holiness Dalai Lama was visiting Lithuania and was visiting Konas with his uh, group of the monks. And uh, in one amazing gallery and was I had such an effect on me of listening monks chanting and creating the sand mandala for weeks there. Uh, I got such a big input from that and like the good energy. And I got right away drifted to the, to the, all of the Tibetan Buddhism, to yoga and all of the spirituality topics. So from mm -hmm. the small days, I was reading already books about the Buddhism and about the yoga and, um, uh, I was dreaming actually about studying Sanskrit and going to live in Tibet, you know, and my mom back then, she was like saying, uh, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, like yeah. I see no future for that, you know? So of course at that time I could not, I could not do it, but through the years, even in Berlin, I was, as, as I was learning music and stuff, I was fully fell into yoga practice, like from the very beginning on, you know, from, from my friend. So been it's this thing was been always there and different workshops different meditations different uh retreats uh crazy retreats i've been trying before and this has of course been always in my mind i just never want to make made money with that you know because mm. i could always be like the yoga teacher maybe when i was in berlin i could start doing like uh, courses but i always felt like i don't want to make money with that and when i moved from berlin to to barcelona um, I had the time to think a bit what I really want to do because I was sure I don't want to work that what I used to work before. I want which to was what yoga. Well, because I've been a lot in Berlin related with uh, all of hospitality. the hospitality exactly, mm. and uh, and one of the last jobs was also like being like a general manager of the of the great of the great craft beer bars and stuff and. Even though if I if if I like being with the people around and working in this environment, I understood that this is over. I, I it's just not for me, and I have to change for the future. This is cannot be that. What, what was it? The lifestyle of generally managing a bar, or was it? What was it that was problematic? Can you remember? Uh, completely messed up sleeping timings. Mm. <laughs> like you know, when you go to work, maybe in a three o'clock or six o'clock and you're coming back at four o'clock in the morning and then you sleep and then you go back to, you know, it's like, it's completely mess. 
not speaking about how much alcohol you drink mm -hmm. <laughs> while you work, you know, and uh, no, it's, it's really, it's really, you know, uh, it's really too much. I mean, at least for me, I can, I could not do this for, for, for my life now. And I guess it's like, um, at some point you have to, you have to actually start doing that, what you really like, <laughs> not that it makes you survive, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, you made a, that's a very important point. At some point in your life, you have to start doing what you like and enjoy, mm, mm. right? So you, the hospitality industry is not known for its compatibility with a healthy lifestyle. Exactly. Well, um, unless maybe you work in some juice shop, I don't know. But... Yeah, and but e e even still, like it's, um, I remember in Berlin, I, I loved Berlin so much because all the bar staff were drinking the product. Right, right? no. So, which I thought was, yeah, crazy, this is crazy. No? <laughs> this is crazy. This doesn't happen in Ireland. It doesn't happen in, in the exactly. UK. You don't, you know, but it happened. No, no, it doesn't happen anywhere. Yeah. I know as well people working. It doesn't happen anywhere. It's just there. So yeah. It's everyone drinks. <laughs> I still kind of love that about Berlin. So <laughs> you had, so you had the experience with the Dalai Lama. You had, you've been doing yoga. You've been taking these classes. Mm. Um, and what, what gave you the confidence to believe you could go out on your own and be an entrepreneur and build your own business. Well, it's like when I moved here, you know, to, to Barcelona and I was, as I was saying that I had time to really think what mm. I really want to do and uh, where I have to go and what I should maybe, what try I started doing also because I thought maybe, maybe crafting, maybe stuff. And, and um, luckily my boyfriend, uh, Mario, he is um, himself is very, empowering person to other people and he's also strongly believe in in being independent and being also self-employed and not be not being dependent to any of the company and and that what he's also himself he is um so i started working first with him you know mm. he's he's like doing like a online marketing he has a, on his a small agency you know so I just started learning learning things because, well, I was still trying to understand, you know, and actually then understood um, that I can maybe write good. I started writing some articles, started doing content writing and stuff. Mm -hmm. I started writing things, and then I I saw some, I saw the training that I did about the coaching, the body healing coaching training that I really it really talked to me when I saw it the ad. Mm -hmm. And after finishing this, I thought, why I just don't start doing on my own and I can do it everything on my own. And this is how it started. I was like, well, all of the knowledge, what I'm getting from the, from the work with, you know, with the online marketing, I'm just going to put it that in my business because nowadays this is the main thing actually. Um, mm -hmm. so we will, I was building my own website. I, I started doing my own content, writing my own content, doing my own social media and, you know, and all of this somehow, because actually, I don't know how you will know if you will do it, if you won't try, mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm preaching to my, to my clients all the time. You must challenge yourself. This, you cannot live all the time in your comfort zone. This is impossible. You must challenge yourself. So mm -hmm. I thought. Okay, I have to challenge myself. You know, I have to, I have to jump into the waters to see it, to test it. You know, and learn I, from that. So the first thing that you did, right? So you were writing content mm. related to healing and and yoga mm. and mindfulness and that type of stuff. You started to go out on your own. The first thing you did was build a website. So this is yeah. step one. Yeah. Because in order to attract very hard, clients, uh, very hard step was so. Oh. <laughs> tell me about that. Who did the website for you? Who who's the oh, developer? No. We did it. Me and my boyfriend, we did it. Wow. Mm. So he's a de he's a developer and he can write the code and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are methods for anybody else thinking about entrepreneurship. You can outsource that. I mean, there are companies in India that can do it relatively cheaply as well. Of course. Can, of course. Yeah. Mm. So that was step number one. Step number two, um, how did you, so you know what you want to do. You know what it's going to be about. How did you go about marketing and building a customer base? Well, this is again comes all of the all of the things we are we are working with that very helpful, obviously, you know, because uh, nowadays everything is based on that. You have to optimize your websites. You have to run ads campaigns on the Google ads campaigns on the Facebook ads campaigns on the Instagram, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is how uh, you target your crowds if if you're working online because for me I'm you know I I live in Spain I I didn't want to now open physical actual cabinet to to work with this it's also extra expenses for me and I also would like to always wanted to work with the people from all over the world you know and not just from Spain mm. so when you work online you just must <laughs> there is no other way than actually doing all of the all of the ads and get finding clients like that or being based on some platforms or wellness platforms and stuff Okay, so there's there's two strategies, right? So mm -hmm. you you can do the Instagram targeted ads, yeah. um, but you can also get listed or get content on other platforms. Oh, sure, yes, yeah. What yeah. what what have you found to be the most successful marketing strategy for your business? I think the most successful was the Google ads. <laughs> Google ads. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I think so. Because I mean, it's also depends, you know, like successful, this was, it means like if you want more successful, like to get more clients or actually that people would go more to your website and stuff. For me, it was always more important to get more clients, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yes, I think the the Google Ads helped me the most. What a <laughs> so great... I say to everyone, do Google Ads. <laughs> yeah, do Google Ads. But Google Ads are expensive. Right, and you need you do need yeah, to yeah, but invest. I guess you need to have like a, also the person who really knows how to optimize those ads and um, mm. yeah. We um, also had some help from outside that also uh, someone is more more specializing in that also helped us. Mm. Interesting, very good. So, um, okay, so your business itself, one mindless. Who are your clients? Describe your perfect client. My perfect client. Or, or any client. <laughs> well, um, most, I would say, like my favorites. I, I, let's go for the favorite. Okay. Um, it's actually successful young professionals. Uh, successful young handsome beautiful professionals were the ones that have actually when you when you speak with them from the first moment you don't think that actually they have problems you know because mm. they have very good life very good uh, jobs they have good income they have they traveling around they have everything you know but of course with that what they have comes all of the problems comes anxiety comes stress comes uh, insomnias comes insecurities with maybe their partners because maybe they don't have enough time to spend with their partners and comes different things um or maybe they're also they they are young professionals they also different generation this most of them actually they're younger than me and what i'm also surprised like wow you know i didn't know that the young generation is so also fragile you know that they have different already securities from the various very young days you know that they have to work uh, on yeah this is i would i would say is my 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 favorite also also artists that are also struggling with uh with uh, depression or addictions or a but I would say mostly, yeah, mostly it's a, it's a young professional who has everything, but at the same time has many problems. Um, and would you say, and what, what you're seeing in your practice and in your business, so you have mm. these young professionals doing really well financially. Mm. What, what are you seeing the most? Is it anxiety? Is it low self-esteem? Is it insomnia? What, what's jumping out that you're seeing? I think first is anxiety always, stress and anxiety and work-related stress. Mm. And this is the most because also people are working in this super fast works. That everything has to be delivered very fast on time. And they are, they are, they are, everyone is freaking out and having anxieties and stuff. So yeah, this is the, this is the most, I think. Mm, then it comes insecurities. Mm comes insecurities yeah they think maybe oh um, um um maybe for men it's very often like okay i i i'm maybe not handsome enough for my boyfriend or for my girlfriend or maybe this or maybe that maybe it's 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 crazy yeah 
And how would you um, how would you work with the person that comes? I mean, you obviously you can't change. You can't get give somebody plastic surgery if they're not handsome enough, right? So, <laughs> I mean, how do you you, you work on self esteem? But the problem normally then? normally like that's the that's the most interesting paradoxical paradoxical thing that these people are super handsome and beautiful, mm. you know. And then they think it's again is this new generation of also social media and Kardashians. I don't know mm-hmm. what what is brought to everyone's in the face that everyone uh, you see everyone on TV with the plastic surgeries, you know, and then maybe mm-hmm. these people look at the mirrors and they think, oh, I doesn't look, I don't look that perfect, you know. But it's like, I mean, you maybe look better even than them. <laughs> well, yeah, there is this epidemic on on social media of, um, I mean, Instagram is the worst offender. Yeah, um, everybody looks. Everybody presents a version of their lives, the best version. They exactly. look stunning. They're on the beach. They're tanned. They're looking amazing. Yeah. They never show the picture. Yeah, at seven o'clock in the morning, when without they have, makeup. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it's always the best version, which everybody else looks at it and goes, "Oh my god," and feels terrible about themselves. Mm. And they're not able to distinguish between, mm. okay, this is a fantasy, and um. So you work with people then online. Mm. Yes, uh, actually, um, until last year, end of the last year, I was working only online. Mm. From the last year, I started giving also yoga classes, physical, actual yoga classes um, mm. here in um, um, outside Barcelona, in San Cugat, where I live. Mm. And yeah, and actually, I have to say, I really liked this human touch, being close to the to the to the people and actually touching them and actually explaining and showing them, you know. Mm. And yeah, this was my and also doing yoga classes um, online as well. And what would what would be the um, so yoga is good for relaxation, right? Particularly well, and flexibility. So many things. Mm. Yeah, I'm showing my health. ignorance there. So, have you ever tried yoga? Um, I keep no. I'm, I keep threatening to do it. Uh, maybe I'll you go to should. one of your classes next time I'm in Barcelona. <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah, no. It's for I'm in my 40s now, and for a man in his 40s, I can't think of anything better to do than yoga because you know flexibility and and um, relaxation and calming the mind is. I mean, it's everything. Um, so okay, so you have the online kind of coaching and life coaching stuff, and then yeah. you also do the um the yoga um, in, in a studio um, in terms of uh, depression, right? Mm-hmm. People are coming, artists are coming to you with, with you with depression. How would you work with that person? It's a very hard, um, it's a very hard topic. Eh? Mm. And um, actually I had a very hard case uh, with one, with one artist, one photographer that has also been struggling with all of the problems and more. And it's been been very hard case. Uh, you work with a lot of questionings, with this kind of self reflecting uh, questions. So every session before before you start even working, you send the person like the big big questionnaire about the way different ways. There are so many questions that they have to answer, and these uh, questions for, for, first of all, it's also for me. So I can kind of create my own map of that person mm. and also these questions as well, the person to first, maybe yourself answer, read and understand, answer, read, understand. So normally we worked also with this person a lot with the questionings like uh, homeworks, a lot of homeworks. He had to uh, analyze himself a lot and stuff. Uh, and on the same time, he was also doing a lot of many, many works from the from the aside, and trying to also explain the person how how our brain works, um, how like our feelings works, how our brain works when we want to do, when we don't want to do. Like there is so many tricks and so many also ways to understand how to maybe control yourself and your mind and how mm. maybe to reprogram yourself mm. you know i don't do like any of the hypnosis or so on but there are still some tricks yeah there, there's a conditioning problem that seems to be happening where people are, exactly. are conditioning into states um, mm. and there's obviously the negative self-critic a that, lot that, that we have in our heads that a just... lot this is the evil it's the mm. worst it's the worst you know it's the worst and 
I, I always say if I hear someone, doesn't matter, it's in at home or the friends, if someone ever says ever, oh, how stupid I am, or like, like, you know, like, what an asshole, what a stupid I am, like, never, never say this to yourself. How do you expect to grow and shine if you will repeat yourself such a things? Like, mm. it's impossible. It's just impossible. You will not believe in yourself ever in anything you do, you know. So the so best that, thing is actually wake up in the morning, look at your eyes and you say, I'm beautiful. I'm amazing. Everything is okay. And I'm going to be perfect today. You know, like just do the manifestations, good manifestations to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can talk yourself into a mood and you can talk yourself totally, out of the mood as well. Totally. totally. Um, in terms of substance abuse and addiction. So you have been working with people, right? Um, Not many, couple, but uh, it's. I would have to say I don't like this angle uh, entering there to to work because I don't have this. I think I don't have background. this knowledge and exactly mm. the medical background to work on this because the substance is very strong, and even if I say we work in this and this and this, usually the substance wins. Mm. And if the person does a couple of steps up. Uh, when the substance enters, this we lose these steps right away, and then come you go back, and so it's so hard for the people to get out of that thing. Mm. So um, this is why um, I I really don't like that much being there because yeah, as as you said, I don't have the medical education for that the clinical stuff. But so you're mm. focused on pe prof young professionals who are feeling overwhelmed, who are feeling anxious, exactly in in the workplace. How how serious is that problem, the professional workplace, and and in terms of like depression and anxiety, and what's the scale of it? Do you think? I think it's very big. It's very big. I would say, I mean, every person who comes to me to ask to get this having this problem. <laughs> so I think I think it's a big problem. It's 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 really big problem now in the world. The work stress. It's really mm. big problem. So, but do, do you find people are coming to you? So from the hospitality industry, for example, mm -hmm. do you find bar staff coming to you? Probably not. No. It's people that are coming, are coming to you from the, probably the corporate world. Exactly. Closer to that. Exactly. The corporate exactly. world, the technology world. There's exactly. something about this the environment. Young, as well, also the young entrepreneurs who is also maybe running their own, their own uh, small companies, like, yeah, I don't know, um, it's a specific, like uh, even could be the music industry, for example, the one I, I don't want to mention, but uh, also who's having maybe some traumas from the past, maybe from their childhoods as well. This is another thing, exactly, the traumas from the past, mm. the traumas with the parents, uh, the big, exactly, pff, I forgot to mention this. This is another thing that is always uh, popping out is the is also different insecurities or different traumas that coming from the family times as well. And also these people now carrying all of this baggage with them for all of these years. And of course, this is affecting their personal life, you know. Well, G Gaber Mate talks a lot about trauma. Mm -hmm. The Hungarian, mm -hmm. Mara, Canadian, brilliant doctor. Um, mm -hmm. And he links trauma to everything and behavior, particularly exactly. addiction. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so if you have, so what I'm thinking is in terms of clients and, and coming to you, so they would be based all over the world and you would do maybe five or 10 coaching sessions with them one on one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they, they, that would be online. Yeah. What kind of, so, we know they're coming to you with stress, anxiety, depression. What kind of results could they expect after 10 classes? I mean, where where can you take them to? I don't want to put you on the spot here, but I'm just curious. <laughs> no, you know, it's like it's also um, the work is all depends from the person. Yeah. Um, depends from the person. How much is he putting the time to do that, what he has to do? Mm. Because many, like many people on the sessions look very active and stuff, but when it comes afterwards, you know, like not everyone is actually doing that, what maybe they, they, they have it on their list, you know, that is actually would help them. So I guess the first thing is depending from the person, how much effort he has, wish and time to do these things. Um, if the person 
has all of, I mean, very often they say, oh, I, I cannot because I, I'm working so much and so on, so on, so on. You must, everyone must to schedule time with themselves, you know? Mm. So because you are, everyone, we are machines that is running uh, as a body. First of all, the physical perfect machines running, but how they are going to run if you won't put an energy into 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 maintaining this machine physically and mentally you know so if the person really puts all the effort i think well i i had a i had a couple of the people that already after the three sessions they were saying oh thank you so much you helped me a lot and i was thinking oh damn <laughs> i got rid of my client pretty fast you know well from, you from know? a business perspective but I was like, I was so happy, you know, like after the three sessions that mm. the person was actually saying like, I'm okay, you know. Mm. Uh, so uh, I think there is not like one size fits all. Mm -mm. Expecting at least better sleep, better understanding of with yourself, mm. learning to breathe, knowing a bit yourself who you really are. Because you you might question if you go for a session with you might question yourself a lot who you really are. You will you would dig deeper what about your past? What are your traumas? What is related now your life with your traumas? So you definitely would know yourself better. <laughs> well, it's it's good to know your traumas so you can know you will know what triggers you. Exactly, because also traumas they're related also with your with the they they trigger. Exactly. Each trigger is up with a trauma as well. Specific traumas has specific effect on the specific body parts. Mm. So also the pain, physical pain, like there are there are some there are some parts of the body that also says to you with what trauma it could be related. And you can kind of map. <laughs> yeah, and so you can work with people to identify. I'm just exactly. thinking in terms of the corporate environment and the, mm. the professional world, mm. that if you can identify and understand the childhood traumas, but mm. when you go into that corporate workplace and that environment, mm. you can be mindful exactly. of the things that will trigger you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, so that you can kind of keep yourself. I mean, in that world, you kind of have to be totally in control and under control. You feel professional and, completely so you need to know the, the, the triggers um, exactly and also you know like uh also things like learning just like breathing mm. like as uh also like if i say to the people if they have to to, to deal with the stressful situations uh I take it from my own personal experience, you know. I used to be always very, very nervous and stressful person when it came to, I mean, even if I, from the small days I was going on the stage, I was still being scared or like nervous to go on stage, you know. Mm -hmm. And through the years, through the years, through the years, I developed this way of breathing that every time before going on stage, or I mean, I meditate every day, I, may, I do the breathing exercises every day, so when it comes something like really, really important to 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 maybe present it or to speak with a bigger crowd or or to to perform. So the same comes to the people when they have maybe big uh, projects and they have to speak also with a uh, with a big crowd at work. Mm. There are so many tools to put you in a place to make you calmer, to control your breath, and you would go maybe with a with a way calmer mind yeah i know we we learned a lot of this stuff in acting school about the importance of the ah, of the breath sure. and breathing from the diaphragm and how it, and, and so how you it should can... know this thing yeah yeah i i do and i i also know how important it is to uh a lot of people think they know how to breathe but Nothing, they don't they don't <laughs> um and and, it, and learning is so is learning it is so important um the number one fear that people when they're asked in studies, at least in recent research that I've come across and heard about online, that they talk about is public speaking. Mm. Right? So how important do you think breathing is in terms of public speaking? Uh, very important. But I think what is another next one is more important is also meditation for that. At least for me mm. personally, for the public, like if I have to speak in the public, mm. uh, there is no way that I will leave home without meditation. <laughs> How long would you meditate for? 
at least 20 minutes, at least, at least. The best would be 40 minutes, one hour. 40 minutes to now. Because there is a click after some time. Sometimes mm. if you just always do 15 minutes, because many, many now nowadays, there are many of the platforms and so on where they speak about, well, at least you can meditate five minutes, 10 minutes. I mean, of course, at least something is better than nothing. That's mm. true. But to really feel the effect of that, at least you should do 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, because there is a click. After a specific time, it comes the click and everything gets easier and it everything flows different. Just have to try. <laughs> So uh, do you, has meditation had a a massive impact on your life, would you say? Oh, really? Yeah. 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 And so you meditate every day? Uh, lately, yes. Actually, the only one time when I, now I, because I had my leg surgery, so I could not sit in my lotus position and I always found it weird meditating and sitting on the chair you know so now for the last few weeks I was I was kind of not regularly meditating mm -hmm. but yes every day it's must I don't know for me it's, it's, I don't know why but I for me I just find the clearance in everything if I start the day with a meditation and the, for me the best is always the morning meditation maybe six mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning I wake up and I meditate for half an hour it's my whole day, it's way more clear. The whole day is way more organized, way more mm. focused. You know, if I work, for me, it's just everything works like in a places, how it has to be, you know, mm. like I don't have that too much stress and oh, I don't get myself distracted. You know, the focus is improving so much. So that's a great tip, right? So that's mm. a great tip um, for somebody who does experience stress throughout the day or, or is, um, I suppose, hijacked or... Um, yes, and it's also making like this, any situations more more calmer and less stressful, yeah. you know, and uh, it's also because your mind is also more calmer. So even if you might have the argue with someone either professionally or personally, mm. whatever, you maybe might not go into that conversation too deep to, to escalate any kind of conflict, you know, that... Mm. but it's also good <laughs> so it's about it's it's all it's about conflict control as well meditation so yeah, everything this... is about control yeah it's about yeah. self-control mm. okay brilliant um and on the um, negative self-critic piece mm -hmm. again remind me is what would you recommend for that inner critic that that voice in everybody's head that constantly tells us we're no good and we're not good enough Never, 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 never let this voice tell you that you are not good enough or in something. And never, like, never say yourself, like, I'm stupid, I am, I'm useless, or I am fat, or I am ugly, or whatever. Come on, never. Because, I mean, how do you expect yourself to be beautiful, to be slim, to be... Uh, attractive and shining if you will say to yourself all the time negative things there is like no way it's impossible you know it's impossible you don't build good things on the bad things this is no way you know or if you find it bad difficult for you just write the note for yourself on the paper and say exactly things that you want to be or you want to or you want to um get them or like or you want to get just write yourself i'm beautiful good morning i'm beautiful i'm shining i'm clever and this day is going to be amazing just write put it in front of your mirror every morning you brush your teeth and you read this and smile and look at your eyes <laughs> so it's about the reinforcement of the positive exactly. message and be exactly. like a ninja when that, exactly when that inner self self critic comes along exactly okay so Here's a here's a question that I think. Mm. Uh, well, I'm, I'm curious to know this one definitely. Who's been your biggest inspiration? Wow, wow, it's hard to say. Different times, different uh, inspirations. You know, mm. different times, different inspirations. Um, wow, because it's also you know, inspirations is people, inspirations is teachings, inspirations is depends from which angle I take. If I take actually my latest inspiration. Uh, in from the spiritual side, 
uh, is my 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 yoga master actually my yoga master of who is really 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 great master and who lives now in Colombia and Andre Ram and of oh, he's just beyond master and uh, every t- uh, time when I have a chance to do the this uh, teacher trainings with him uh, I'm just been blown away because it's a really great mind um obviously spiritually for many years it's been Dalai Lama <laughs> I was I was maybe those times was uh when I was also like uh, way younger and I was watching his teachings in a Buddhism you know and even though I was not understanding that time all of the terms of the Buddhism you know because mm. they are the whole philosophy is so difficult and so complex uh, he was my inspiration um, back then. Um, also, Sadhguru. Do you know Sadhguru, actually? He's, no. he's He became, well, well, you should check him out. He's a, he's a cool yogi dude. And he's actually now very known in the in Western world because he's traveling all around and he's giving the 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 lectures and he is great he is great uh guru i would say and he's actually speaking to to nowadays people in in their language you know that so you can understand everyone can understand um can you think of a book that inspired you Mm. now i'm like checking i have many (laughs) i have many that inspired me there was there was a wow the long time ago I was reading this book when I was in Berlin actually I read this book of James Redfield the book was called um, Secrets of Shambhala and uh, in actually when I was started reading the book I, I I didn't know if it was a real story or the uh, or the fictional story of course in the end it was a fictional story and. Um, I really liked it because it was showing the 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 trip of the writer. Well, the writer is saying how he's going from the trip to China and through China to Tibet and trying to find the secret uh, city of Shambhala, which you can enter only if you have the specific level of the energy. A very interesting book. Very interesting book. I liked it a lot. I should maybe read it again. <laughs> yeah, I think I might get I think I might read it myself. And last question. What does the future hold for yoga Dambruskaita? Mm, uh, a lot. <laughs> Actually a lot. Um I'm planning to study psychology, to start studying psychology this year. Mm. Uh, because uh, following, as we were saying before about there are specific cases when I'm always sometimes holding myself back because I don't have this, the clinical, this exactly this kind of the level that I could say, okay, I can, I can really help you out. So I thought Mm. I should go for that and I should get a degree in that. And I did many years of the, of the, of the, of the the, um, spiritual part in the yoga. I would like to go more now direct, you know? Mm. to know so i definitely going this uh for that so my four years is going to be <laughs> with the books mm. and and still teaching i am thinking about starting the new podcast another podcast uh and maybe this time is going to be the one in my kitchen speaking with the music people art people cooking vegan food and having the glass of wine Mm. So I have this idea. Let's see how it's going to develop. Mm. Uh, obviously, playing more shows with my project as Informa. Mm. Um, this is for sure. Releasing soon maybe the new record because we're spending a lot of time in the studio uh, recording. And mm. finally traveling again <laughs> more. <laughs> Post-COVID. Actually, that wasn't the last question. I have another question. Okay. <laughs> Would you consider going... So you're, all the stuff you're talking about doing here is 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 living and, and traveling your own path, mm. being your own boss, living the entrepreneur's life, doing your own stuff, um, forging your own path, creating your own destiny. Mm. Would you consider going back into, say, a job, nine to five type job into the corporate work work environment or professional? Is that on the cards? Depends, you know, what kind of job. It's actually in not sometimes a year ago or something like this, I was actually 
um while I was already doing one mind zone and working with my clients, I was actually also thinking about applying for being um also this wellness advisor coach for the bigger corporate company as well. Is that but, a space? Is that a is that a, a space? Oh yeah. Where- this yeah. is this is like now as, as apparently is a big thing because d- different corporation com- corporate companies they are also aware of the fact that the people are working in the companies and they are stressed having out. stress and also mm. depends on what kind of companies you work you can be not only stressed out but maybe you can get traumatized as well depends maybe from what with what kind of content <laughs> you are working you know mm. um, so obviously they are also offering this to their um, to their employees. Mm. So I, I I knew about this kind of positions and I even was thinking about, I even, no, I even actually applied the thing for, for that just for curiosity. And obviously they asked the psychology <laughs> degree. They wanted so, a psychology background. Of yeah. course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So of course this is totally, uh, no. so if that would be something like this, mm. I would maybe think because, you know, then I still would feel not being part of that thing because I would be just there doing helping for the people who works that jobs you know I still would have my mission to help them out yeah well you the the important word you used there was mission right so Mm. you have a mission and a purpose and a meaning to what you Mm. do you're separate from the machine and you're helping to keep people well exactly um which I think is a which it would be which would be, I suppose, an interesting avenue for those who have left and considering going back, but don't want to get dragged into the, into the, um, into all that stuff again. Exactly, finding your niche or like finding you know niche, yeah. finding your place, mm. level it in between and find your place. Where do you want to be? I mean, it's Where also this. It, the, what do you fit or what do you want to try? It doesn't mm. mean that you might go you, if you get in, you might stay there forever. You know, you just at least have to try. Mm. If mm. you came up to this idea, Yoga Damraskaita, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Connor, so it's much. Been fun. It's been a it pleasure. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Talk to you soon.